The title of today's message is The Ultimate Trickster. The Ultimate Trickster. I couldn't help myself this morning, and I asked some people when I told them the title of the message, who's the ultimate trickster? Who's the ultimate trickster? Pardon? I get a lot of different answers, and everybody can give that answer to, for themselves, right? Who is the ultimate trickster? Now, I want to say that God's word challenges us and transforms us as we wrestle with it. I always think about Jacob, deceiver. You're a deceiver. Who are you? Who does the world say you are? What does the devil say about your life? But most importantly, what does God say about you? And what do you believe about you? And there's something about wrestling with God to discover who we are, to discover who he is that changes us. So God's word has the power to change our lives when we wrestle with it. There are many voices in this world trying to be heard today. And many of these voices that are in the world will deceive us. They'll bring falsehood. They'll bring unreality into our life. Isn't that true? And when we listen to the voices in this world, it can rob us of life. It can rob us of laughter. It can rob us of joy. It can rob us of identity and significance and purpose. But there's a voice of our Father in the living Word whose name is Jesus. And His voice in His living Word changes our lives, sets us free, and, as we're going to discover, destroys evil and sin in the world. The world is actually groaning. That's, that's one of the themes that's really dear to our church. The world is groaning under the burden and bondage of sin and corruption. And if you don't believe me, you can go and ask any unbeliever even. You don't have to get all theological. What do you believe about Jesus Christ? You can ask them, so what's wrong with this world? And as much time as you will let them, they will, let, they will talk your ear off. And you'd ask them, hey, do you trust politicians? Do you trust government? Do you believe that society is the best it could be? And they, they will chew your ear off. And, and because God has written his law in our heart, many of the things they say are true right? We're tired of injustice. We're tired of evil. We're tired of sorrow, suffering, sin. We're tired of all the things that go wrong in life. Well, I got a good idea. Did you know that all life is suffering? But if you will follow this path, you will never feel suffering again? Yeah. Follow the Eightfold Path and be a Buddhist. Why? Don't be attached to anything. Get rid of all attachment and you'll be free from suffering because suffering's bad. But Jesus came, and he suffered with us because God actually loves us to feel compassion for us to care about one another. If you don't love, if you don't care, if you don't engage, you, you won't feel sorrow and suffering in one sense, although, I mean, pain is still pain, right? But you won't feel joy. You won't feel companionship. You won't feel life as God has created you to experience it. And the most essential thing that we're meant to experience is love, relationship, and fellowship. And that is why Jesus died for us, so that we could experience fellowship with our Father in heaven. So the world is groaning under this burden of sin, waiting to reconnect with God, and waiting to be delivered from evil in the church of Jesus Christ. God has invested the seed of the kingdom in us to bring life to a dying world. Isn't that exciting? It's exciting to me. So anyway, with that being said, wrestling with God's word. You ever notice that there are things in God's word that you just kind of gloss over? No, that's not really in there. I don't want to see that. Oh, no. Right? I don't really want to look at that. So Ken Payone, one of the teachers at Fortis Academy and me, for many years had 
regular book clubs. And one day we were having our book club, and we got off topic very seriously. I don't even remember how it was connected to the topic. I mean, there must have been a rabbit trail, right? And he starts asking about 1 Kings chapter 22. And I said, oh, no, please, we don't really want to talk about that, do we? But we talked about it. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. And while, and before we talk about it, I need to give a little background, but not a lot of background, or we'll never get out for lunch. So the background is that we know that King Jehoshaphat was, was a king of Judah, and he was a God-fearing king, right? Because, you know, the, the kingdom was divided. You had the two kingdoms, Judah and Israel. And if I say the name of the king of Israel at this time, most of us would know his name. His name was Ahab. Anybody heard about Ahab? Ahab was a horrible king. I won't say he was the worst king or not the worst king. I don't really know how you measure absolute wretchedness. Right? But he was pretty wretched. And he was so wretched that he killed the priests of the Lord, established the prophet, false prophets, the prophets of Baal. I mean, he was greedy, he was corrupt, he was a tyrant, he was evil, and the people were miserable under his reign. But being a king, you know, he had his eyes on a city. I want to take the city. For three years, he was, he was pondering and scheming, how am I going to take the city? And, and the city should have belonged to Israel, but they lost it because of rebellion, right? So Jehoshaphat goes down to visit. Jehoshaphat goes to visit Ahab, and Ahab says, hey, will you go to war with me and help me take the city? Sure thing. That's what the Lord, it belongs to Israel. Let's go take it. But before we do, let's go and inquire of the Lord. What does the Lord say? I mean, that is such a great and important thing in our life, isn't it? I've got a plan. Yes, what's your plan? My plan is to do something, but first let me ask the Lord so I don't waste my time or end up perishing in the process. Is the Lord in it or not? And that was the context. He, uh, Jeho- so Ahab brings his prophets, and they're all prophesying, go take the city, God is with you, blah, blah, blah. And Jehoshaphat says, hey, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we can inquire of? And he goes, oh yeah, there's this guy Micah. But I don't like him. What does he say about Micah? He says, I hate him. I hate him. Because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but only evil. <laughs> a clue phone. <laughs> a prophet of the Lord only prophesies evil. Wake up call, you think, but no. So now let's read the passage. Um, let's turn this up a little bit so I don't have to hold it close to my face. Thank you. We're starting in verse 15, chapter 22. Then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? Down a little bit. And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Shh. He brought a prophet of the Lord, and he prophesied the exact same thing. Then going on, it says, So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then he said, I saw Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Then Micah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all of the host of heaven standing by, and on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall? at Ramoth Gilead. So one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. And the Lord said to him, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. 
And the Lord said, you shall persuade them and shall prevail. Go and do it. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours. And the Lord has declared disaster against you. Does anybody have a problem with this passage? I mean, Ken, Ken, when he brought this up, and I just, Ken, that is such a troubling passage. Why? Okay, where do I begin? You know, there's a scene, and, and there's a lot of neat stuff in there. We see the throne room of heaven, right? And it, it really, we learn so much about God if we dare to look at Scripture. So here's God on the throne, and he is not a tyrant or a ruler over robots. He does not program things to function exactly as he programmed it. And, he, and so we see all of these themes about relationship and creativity, even in the throne room of God. I mean, God could have said, hey, I want to kill this dude. Go do this. Yes, sir. Dun, 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 dun. Marching order like an army. But instead, he shares his heart. I'd like to, I would like to see Ahab die. And so he lets the spirits, the angel, angelic beings, come and give him idea after idea after idea. Isn't that interesting? And this is the government of God. This is how God rules. This is relationship. This is fellowship. This is creativity. I just don't like what they're doing. And so it's like, I, I wonder what the ideas of those other angels were. We don't know. We have no idea. But now one of the angels, oh, see, I, you notice I keep calling them angels. That was one of the arguments that Ken and I had. I said, listen, I know all of the Bible commentators throughout the ages have hated this passage too. The, the Protestant reformers said, oh, we can't take this passage. So it had to be an evil spirit. But I was wrestling with this with Ken. I said, I can't believe it's an evil spirit because these are the angels that are serving God and they're all giving their ideas to do what God has asked them to do. And then God actually says, that's a great idea. Go and do it for me. I go, that's, an, that's a spirit being that is serving the Lord. And it says, the Lord has put this word in their mouth. The Lord had put a lying word in the mouth of the prophets. <sighs> it's painful, isn't it? I find it painful. So that, like, all these commentators have said, oh, that was an evil spirit. Or they try, to, they try to give all of these answers. But when you're facing that scripture head on, I said to him, I can't believe that it's anything one other than God himself sending a servant angel to go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets, and I don't like it. If God would put a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets, does that make you feel very secure? No, it doesn't. If God would use lying to accomplish his will, does that challenge anyone in here? See what I mean? Isn't there a lot here that needs to be wrestled with and pondered? So that was it. We were off to the races. We had like an hour and a half long discussion about this passage because it was so troubling to me. And so I started working through it. Okay, the first thing I don't like. I don't like the fact that he lies because isn't the commandment, thou shalt not lie. Right? But as we were talking about it, I said, well, actually, the literal commandment is thou shalt not bear false testimony. And as we were wrestling with that passage, and I was thinking about it, I said, listen, we understand that a false testimony is like, hey, this person is a real rascal and a scumbag and blah, 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 and you are misrepresenting reality to destroy somebody. And false testimony, where it really rubber hits the road is, hey, you know what? I saw Johnny steal something. Yeah, throw him in prison. He's guilty. I've borne a false testimony against him, right? You see, there's a difference between false testimony and lying. And then I started to ask questions, like in Scripture, you know, people, like I said, we gloss over these things in Scripture rather than wrestling with God. But the more we wrestle with God and the more we understand the way he governs, the way he rules, and the things that he values, the more we are able in this world to reproduce it in a way that brings life. So as we were wrestling with that passage, I said, the primary 
purpose of that commandment is to establish justice in the earth. Does that make sense? And the first time I ever thought about that was when we were wrestling with that passage. The purpose of that commandment is to maintain justice in the earth. And then we thought about it, and I thought about lying. Do you remember the Hebrew midwives? Pharaoh, another evil, wretched tyrant. Are we allowed to talk about people that way? Yeah, I think we can. Well, we did, so it's too late. Um, Pharaoh, these Jews, oh, sorry, Israelites. They were not Jews yet, not called Jews yet. These Israelites are multiplying. They reproduce like rabbits. There's too many of them. They could take us over, tell you what to do, kill their children. So he gives the midwives a commandment. Obey those who are in authority over you, right? The commandment is when the Israelites give birth, kill it, a male. Put them to death. That's why Moses was hidden, right? But, the Hebrew, but these midwives, they had the law of God written in their heart, and they knew it was wrong. So they disobeyed the commandment of Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh brought them into their, his presence and said, what's going on? And these Hebrew midwives lied to the face of Pharaoh, saying, these Israelite women are strong, not like the Egyptian women, and they give birth without, before we even get there. Right? And then the word of God says that God... De- um, dealt well with the Hebrew midwives because what they had done. So that it, the scripture is clear that in that context, they did what was pleasing to the Lord. If, if they had lied, or had, you know, they lied to Pharaoh and God blessed them. So somehow what they did was morally correct and God blessed them, literally blessed them for these actions. Is this challenging to anybody? So, okay, we, we, jump, we fast forward. Israel's going into the promised land, and they send out spies. And, and the spies, Rahab hides the spies in her house. And they come to Rahab, and they say, where are they? And she lied to them to save, to save those spies. And God blessed her because of it. Interesting stuff, isn't it? So the question, you know, we often hear this. If you were a believer in Nazi Germany, would you have hid Jews in your house? And if the Nazis had come to your house, boom, 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 boom. I know you're a Christian, and I know you don't tell a lie, so tell me, are there any Jews in your house? Oh, okay. It would miss the heart of the commandment. It would miss the purpose of the commandment to establish justice. I don't like this stuff, but this is scripture. So as we were talking and wrestling about these things, I started to think about it this way. If these behaviors God put in scripture as models for us to to follow, then we should see this kind of behavior in God himself acting right. Doesn't that make sense? But it also challenges me in so many ways because we know God is a God of truth and the devil is the father of lies. He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning, right? So I went and looked up the word um, liar in the Greek, sustus, and here's what it says in, I have to turn the page, the exegetical dictionary of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, in Jewish tradition, God is considered the truthful and inherently faithful one. Therefore, sustus is usually used of the attitude of opposition to God, an inclination towards that which is worthless. It is not a matter of untrue or incorrect words, but rather of a person's opposition to God. Sustus characterizes fundamental opposition to God, which in itself leads to an attitude of falsehood. For example, of rejection of God's truth in Jesus. Isn't this stuff interesting? But you ask, why are you even, you know, it's interesting, but what does that have to do with us, right? What the first thing is I'm saying is we wrestle with God's word, we come to know him. And the more that we know him as he is, the more we are able to serve him. But there are also some real important truths here to unpack. 
So after I went home from our book club, I did the only logical thing that a person would do afterwards, right? I pulled out the Bible commentaries. And I want to read to you some, um, just two passages out of the commentary because I found it really interesting. This is from the Brazos. Both passages are from the Brazos Theological Commentary on the Bible. And it's about this passage. Further and more basically, this passage makes it abundantly clear that Yahweh is not a great marshmallow in the sky. He is not a God who plays softball, nor is he a God of the philosophers or a gorgeous but impotent God, um, force in heaven. He is a warrior who fights to win, and deception is part of his holy art of war. Elsewhere, Yahweh encourages his people to use deceptive military tactics, and on more than one occasion, he deploys an evil spirit to set traps for his enemies. Is this interesting to anyone? But are, a lot of you guys still here, but I still don't feel comfortable with it yet because it still left me insecure. And it could be a lying spirit in the prophets. How can I trust anything? Right? Isn't that the question that we're all asking? If God could use deception to further his purposes, how then shall I stand in this world in confidence? Isn't that the crisis of faith that you go through? I did. I was crazy. My mind was numb after reading that passage. And then here it is. He is straight with the straight, merciful to the humble, but cunning with the wicked. The God who catches the wicked in their own devices, who leads his enemies into the very traps they set for the righteous. This is a God to be loved, but he is also a God to be feared. One should be grateful to be in and remain in his good graces. For it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of this God. Yahweh is the ultimate trickster that outfoxes all human attempts to escape him. Yahweh is not only cunning, he is transcendently, infinitely cunning. The conclusion that God employs deception against deceivers should not lead us to distrust or anxiety. There is a simple way to avoid falling into the traps of the infinitely cunning God. Humbly trust him, for he is merciful to the merciful and to the pure. He is pure. Is that exciting to anybody? And what I love about that is there really is a position for all human beings where we can be secure in all of life where we know that we can have confidence and trust God. And that's humility. We need to be humble before God. But we also need to walk in the fear of the Lord, don't we? Because God cares about righteousness. If we are selfish, if we are self-centered, if we're using others for our own selfish ends, if we are deceiving other people, in living in pretense and falsehood, then God is an ultimate trickster because he loves us and cares about us. And he loves us enough to deliver us from our own wicked ways. Isn't that exciting? But he also loves the world enough to deliver the world from their own wicked ways. So now if I take a step back and look at what we see here in that passage. We see something that is common to humanity, a world that is out of order, a power structure that seems impossible to overcome, a situation that seems so hopeless that even after the encounter at Mount Carmel, Elijah went and ran because of Ahab and Jezebel, because of how lost and broken the world seemed. And that's the voice that goes through this world. It is impossible that things should change. It is impossible for justice to reign. It is impossible for things to turn around and to turn around suddenly, 
to turn around amazingly. And we often, do we not often calculate, hey, how many people are there that can vote or can't vote or whatever? And, you know, we like, can we see an end to an abortion? Let's count up the numbers of voters. But you see, even in that statement, we're missing a revelation that he is the God of war. He goes to war for the lost, for the broken, for the oppressed, for the widow, for the orphan. He goes to war to set nations free. Isn't that encouraging to anyone? That this God that we just read about is active in heaven asking angels, what are your ideas? He's active on earth in the same way. Go, make disciples. Go and preach the word. Go and do my will. And, and know that this God is at work. It's not man versus the devil. It's not man versus tyrannical, oppressive tyrants. It's God working through his servants. Isn't that encouraging? And it's encouraging that God didn't just say, I'm going to... See, could we get these kind of silly pictures? God Almighty is mad at you. Zap, you're dead. No. He, look at how creative God was to take out Ahab. And he let Ahab's own pride and arrogance and wanting to hear falsehood, he let his own arrogance and grandeur overcome him. Not only that, but God even told him the truth through the prophet, right? He even told him how he was tricking him. He was that far gone that God himself could tell him how he's being tricked, and he still was tricked. Wild, isn't it? So anyway, I'm going to read a little, talk a little more about Scripture and then try to, by God's grace, bring it home to us today. Because the, the, the Word of God is amazing. It transforms us. It revives us. <clears throat> Turn that up a little more because I, I keep trying to get louder so I can hear it. Yes. Um, Tuesday Life Group. I've really been enjoying the Tuesday Life Group online. Actually, I enjoy it in present in physically, but I also enjoy it online. And a few weeks ago, yeah, I think Mary Lou may have been there, we were reading the passage where Peter was in prison, Right? There's actually a whole story, so I'm going to tell it really fast just for fun since we still have time. Yes. So there's this incredible story of Herod, the benevolent, no, Herod the good and kind and just, no. Herod the petty, petulant, tyrant dictator. All right, that's better. That's more like it. So Herod, you know, he was not a good guy. And in this passage, we saw that he took James, the apostle James, and put him to death. And he discovered something. It, wasn't, it was probably his own hatred and evil that put James to death. But he discovered, hey, the Jews really enjoyed when I killed him. I'm going to do it again. And so he grabs Peter and throws him in prison. And now Peter's in prison. But Herod, wanting to celebrate his victory, realizes that they're in the middle of a feast of Passover, or a feast of Israel, and says, I'm going to wait until it's over, and then I'm going to kill him. That way, nobody steals my thunder. And it says, the church made constant prayer to the Lord for Peter while he's in prison. So Peter's sitting there, sleeping, and all of a sudden, an angel comes, you know, get your clothes. We're getting out of here. Now, Peter's like, I'm not sure this is even real. He really did not know if it was real or if he was dreaming. But sure enough, the chains are loosed. He slips past the guards, gets out of the prison, and he is out. And now when he's in the streets, he realizes, oh, no, this is for real. This is not a dream. I mean, we often have ideas of faith that take away humanity. Peter, the mighty apostle, he's literally being delivered from prison, and it's so surreal to him that he doesn't even know if he's not just dreaming. I love the humanity of that. So now he's out in the streets, and he goes, okay, where am I going to go? I'm going to church. So he goes to the church, knock, 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 knock. And when the servant comes to the door, ah, 
Ah, it's his spirit. Shh, runs away and leaves him outside the door. Wait a minute. They've been praying ceaselessly for Peter, and God answered their prayer. I mean, there's so much we learn about Scripture, and it's so encouraging because this tells us that they weren't naming it, claiming it, blabbing, blabbing it, grabbing it. They were praying. God, they're like, oh yeah, God is going to deliver Peter out of prison because I'm praying. I prayed the prayer of faith, brother. No. They've got the heart of the Father in them. Lord, please don't let Peter die. We need him. God answers their prayer. And they can't even believe it. Oh, it's a ghost. And then they realize God answered their prayer. How awesome is it that God uses us? I mean, I'm hoping when you hear this, you realize they were real human beings. They were not like saints that you see on the stained glass walls with the, or windows with the halos. You know what I mean? They were like us. Who could be like Peter? You. Me. Do you dare to believe that? Do you dare believe that God could use us to work such a miracle? Do you believe our prayers have that much power and that much potency? Because this is what Scripture teaches us. Isn't that wild? The more we see it as it is, the more we realize that we're looking into a mirror. Interesting, isn't it? So my theory has always been that James got taken, got killed before the church began praying, so he died. That prayer was the means that God used to deliver Peter. Right? Isn't that an interesting theory? Because that's what it said, unceasing prayer was made for Peter. I also have another theory, that in those days the two most prayed for men were Saul of Tarsus and Herod. Just the way it works. They were persecuting the church, and these were believers and disciples. And it could be, Lord, we know you died for their sins, so please help them to come to know you. And there are some Christians that God's grace works, them, works in them in that manner. And then I'm sure there were a whole bunch of people that were like, God, please have mercy and save us from his hand. Right? No matter how you prayed, they were the most prayed about people. I would dare to even say that the unbelievers' voice were be was being heard in heaven concerning Herod. Remember in the Exodus, I have heard the groans or the cries of my people, and I have come down. Herod caused the unbelieving world to groan. And that's what we were studying. Herod, when Peter was removed from, you know, was delivered from prison, he was embarrassed. The guards got put to death. And then they, they give us a little passage about Herod. You know, it says that the people of Tyre and Sidon, they, you know, Herod had a beef with them, but the people needed to get food. And so they worked politically to get Herod to come down there. And when, and when Herod was down there, he spoke to the people. And it, sa it says that the people said, the voice of God and not a man. And God struck him. And worms ate his body and he died. And when we read that passage, you know, it looks, if you look at just that passage by itself, it looks like God struck him down because he took the praise of God. No. God had kept showing Herod mercy and grace. Mercy and grace. There were signs and wonders and miracles constantly worked for Herod to bring him to repentance, and he kept hardening his heart against the truth. The, first, the greatest sign was when he delivered Peter from prison. That was a major wake-up call. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, maybe God is real and is at work, and maybe I need to repent. But my love for sin, my love for for unrighteousness and unreality 
I've hardened my heart and chosen darkness over the light. And this, you know, it was actually Mike and I were hanging out talking the other day about some of this very thing. Because God's grace works like a light in every person's life. And I really believe that the praying apostolic church carried so much light, it was like turning on a bright floodlight at once. And I know many people who've had radical conversion experiences, like I did. One way, there's many ways you can describe it, but there's principles that were always real. And that principle for me, it was like light suddenly shone on me and all unreality was broken. And it was like I was shown the kingdom of God, but also the pleasures of the kingdom of darkness. And I knew in that moment that you had to choose to surrender all to King Jesus or to reject and harden your heart. And I knew that that hardening of the heart against that level of light is like a, almost a permanent level hardening. But for most people, it doesn't happen that radically. It happens with this daily light shining. Turn to me. Come follow me. Come walk with me. Turn away from that. In our daily choices, are either to surrender and yield and follow or turn away and harden and become darkness. And, and, you know, we talk a lot about deathbed. Do you believe that people can repent on their deathbed? Absolutely. The thief on the cross. But you have to understand the principle of hardening of the heart. Every time we harden our heart against the Holy Spirit. We have trained ourselves. And it becomes harder and harder and harder to repent. But as we surrender our lives, as the Lord is leading and guiding us, we become trained to walk with the Lord. And that is what we as all believers, need to train ourselves for. So going back to Herod at his death, I mean, that, that's why I love wrestling with Scripture, because we, we, we learn so many things. And in one sense, we could say that God answered the prayers of the church for both Saul and Herod and stopped the persecution because he loves the church. But did you ever think that God also cared about the people that were being oppressed even the unbelievers, God causes it to rain on the righteous and unrighteous alike. And whenever evil is overcome and overthrown, the earth rejoices. The people rejoice. So it's strange, right after we were having that Bible study, I love how this happens with Scripture, right? The day after we were talking about these things on a Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, I was reading Isaiah with a commentary. In Isaiah 14, 4 through 7, says this, How the oppressor has ceased. The golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers. He who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he who ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted, no one hinders. The whole earth is at rest. They break forth into singing. The picture there, because sometimes when you read the scripture, it goes in and out, and it's hard. You really have to slow down and read it and understand it. But basically saying the oppressor, the one who made everybody miserable, the one who made himself rich, the golden city at everybody else's expe expense, has been broken. Now there is rest in the earth, and the people break forth into singing. Whenever righteousness breaks forth, whenever injustice is destroyed, the whole earth rejoices. It says, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. Sin is a reproach to any people. So the commentary, um, New International Commentary in the Old Testament, Isaiah is able to believe in a God who is larger than the gigantic world monarchs. I read these things because it's challenging. Do you believe this? 
who is able to break their scepters, symbols of their power, like matchsticks. The audacity of such faith is almost breathtaking, yet that is precisely the burden of Isaiah's preaching. The God of tiny Judah is the God of all the universe, and before his bar, all human pretensions must bow. The idea of singing in view of deliverance is a special feature of the book of Isaiah. The fierce song of the drunken conquerors is replaced by the jubilant song of the redeemed. In the place of wailing of mourners for this death, there is a spontaneous outburst of laughter and joy. I thought this was interesting. The next morning, he writes this, Herod, fearful that people might rejoice at his death, had imprisoned all the elders of the Jews with orders that they should be killed at the hour of his death. It is a testimony of the immensity of his pride that he did not realize that upon his death his capacity to command would cease. But cease it did, and in the general jubilation at his death, the elders were released. <laughs> That's wild, isn't it? I mean, no, this is history. It's almost surreal. This guy here, it was so bad that he thought, oh, people know I'm a tyrant. They don't like me at all, and they're going to celebrate when I die, but I'll fix them. And he took all the elders of the Jews and put them in prison. They're to be put to death when I die. Thank God he didn't live another 30 years, right? Poor guys in prison. We call that wrongful imprisonation, or, right? The point of that is that these they're drunken songs of the conquerors, we rule the world, you are under my thumb, I am great, you stink. Versus, hallelujah, the Lord has redeemed us, the jubilant songs of the redeemed. I, I wanted to paint all these pictures this morning because I'd like to, you know, if, I would like to ask you, what kind of song do you sing in your heart every day? And not just like, I'm singing the Christian songs because I like the Christian songs, but I mean, what is your perception of reality? What is your hope for today and the hope for the future? What is your testimony before the nations? How do you see God? How do you know God? Because on, it's these kind of visions of the Lord that come from Scripture that renew our mind and let us see our circumstances differently. They let us see world history differently. We don't have to listen to all these voices and ideas of what's going on, but we can look at Scripture and see the ultimate trickster is at work in the world, going to war to bring his kingdom to set the people free. But for many people, what you need to know is that God who cares about taking out world tyrants. That God who cares about bringing justice into all the nations. He actually cares about your personal situation. And that's where the rubber hits the road. Because there are many people that are going through all kinds of difficulties either fears of what could happen or actually experiencing what is happening. And I know a lot of people that have been affected economically during this time of quarantine in a very negative way. And I know that some didn't even want to talk about their situations because they felt humiliated. They felt ashamed. But people, we all go through difficulties in life. And you, you know, there's all kinds of ideas. Like, God will bless you and you will never, if, whoa, that must be sin in your, no. The earth is groaning. Just like the virus doesn't respect people, troubles don't respect people. But God is with his people, and he has a plan to save. He has a plan to redeem. The same God that schemed to take out Ahab is scheming your resurrection. He's scheming your transformation. He's scheming 
you being conformed into the image of Christ. And God allow, I mean, there's so many things like God would not allow us to go through that. Tell that to the Christians that were thrown to the lions. Well, they must have had sin in their life. No. God is wise and loving and good. And when we have that foundation in our life, we know that whatever we face in this world, God means it for good. And we can trust him. If we remain humble before him, the ultimate trickster is scheming on our behalf for our resurrection. Isn't that exciting? So with that in mind, I just wanted to wrap it up because it's not good to be a church and not ask some of, well, one, some things about practical for us as a people. We need a view of reality that gives us hope because we see that God is at work in the world. The world is longing for hope. They're longing for significance. They're longing for meaning, right? And don't think for a second that people even unbelievers in this world don't care about a lot of the things that are broken. They will, you know, work in organizations to stop human trafficking. They will work in organizations to help the poor, the hungry, the needy, right? They will work to help people um, that are less fortunate because it's written on the hearts of all men. These things are not meant to be, Right? But we have to have an ultimate hope that it will turn around. It's Christ, the gospel, that turns it around, right? And that is what we carry. People need hope that tyranny and oppression over taxation. Not going to go down that road. All of the things that cause people to groan can be delivered through God's grace, working through his people. The key, we said it last week, the key to national transformation is personal transformation. That's why what we're doing as a church is so important. God's agenda to heal and deliver and save the world is to do it one life at a time. Turning us from our sin, turning us from our iniquity, causing us to love like he has loved us, right? And instead of all of the evil and suffering and sorrow and pain that we would have caused, now we bring the benevolence of his rule, his reign to fall on the righteous and unrighteous. And it all happens as that grace comes to us and says, walk with me, follow me, do right in my eyes. Verses getting angry, getting bitter, getting frustrated, compromising with the world, compromise with sin. See, the way the devil works is he puts pressure on you. I'm in pain. I'm in pain. And then he says, this is the only way to relieve the pain. And then you, then he says, look how crummy you are because of what you've done. Right? It's a road that leads to death. It's a road that robs you of life. He is the way of life. He is the way of salvation. So this church, us gathering together as the people of God, is God's solution to the nations. We need to grow mature in Christ, hearing and wrestling with God's word, praying, praying for one another, being in fellowship with one another, liking each other, laughing with each other, enjoying life together, seeing what is good and true and beautiful and celebrating the goodness of the Lord, singing the song of the redeemed. Wow! He wants us to sing a song of the redeemed that we have joy, we have peace and righteousness in Christ. We have hope, we have future, we have purpose, we have significance, we have value. These are the things that are more attractive than social media. Well, you know, here, the, I'll, I'll, I'm going to cut all this other stuff out, and I'm going to say it this way. People are created in the image of God. We are created to connect the way he has designed us. He has designed us for fellowship with him. 
And as we have fellowship with him, then our fellowship with one another abounds. But when we start to disconnect from fellowship with God, then our fellowship with one another ceases because we start to become jerks. Right? Or insecure. I don't want to see anybody. I feel horrible. I feel bad. I feel ashamed. Right? Ah, God, don't come near me. I'm naked. Did you eat from the tree, Adam? I made a covering. Jesus died so that you can be redeemed. You can know the Lord. You can walk with God. You can be in his presence. And you can be his ambassadors in this earth. We need maturity. So I'll finish it with that verse from 2 Samuel 22. The great ultimate trickster. How can we have confidence with the merciful? You will show yourself merciful. With the blameless, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. With the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble, but your eyes are on the proud that you may bring them down. God wants us to be humble, to walk with him so that we can be the vessels he uses to deliver a world from bondage by making disciples of all nations. I was going to say teaching them to observe all that he's commanded us, but I'll put it another way calling all people to walk with God. Amen. Well, Lord, we pray that you would show yourself to be the ultimate trickster today by turning the situation around in ways that are surprising, like you did for Peter in prison. Lord, we pray for a great awakening at Life Springs Church that we would dare to believe that you are such a mighty God, but we would also dare to believe that you will use us. Lord, we pray that we all would yield to the leading and guidance of your Holy Spirit in our life, that we would be those that walk together in the presence of the Lord, following Jesus and calling the nations to come and follow the Lord. Lord, we confess that what people need is to connect with you. They need to know your love personally, the love that you revealed when you died on the cross for our sins, but to know the power of your resurrection. We pray that the wind of your Holy Spirit would blow in this community, and that after this pandemic ceases, after the quarantine ceases, Lord, we pray that you would go and you would send out laborers into your harvest to draw people to the one who died for them, who rose again and lives forever. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. The Lord be with you.